Welcome to UO Today. I'm Paul Pappas, Director of the Oregon Humanities Center. My guest today is Laura Bavilsky, Associate Professor of English at the University of Oregon. Bavilsky's scholarship explores early modern British understandings of group and individual identity. Her first book, Barbarous Play, Race on the English Renaissance Stage, examines depictions of race in early modern drama by William Shakespeare, Christopher Marlowe, John Webster, and Thomas Middleton. Bavilsky led the University of Oregon's successful application effort to host Shakespeare and his first folio, a traveling exhibition. Sponsored by the Folger Shakespeare Library in partnership with the Cincinnati Museum Center and the American Library Association, the 2016 exhibit will mark the 400th anniversary of the death of the poet playwright. Thank you, Laura, for coming on the show. It's a pleasure. First, um, tell us what is the first folio of Shakespeare? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so this is a volume that was put together by two of Shakespeare's friends and like Shakespeare, fellow shareholders in the company after he died, seven years after he died in, in uh, 1616. Um, and so it came out in 1623. And they were following on a kind of mini trend in the period that was inaugurated by Shakespeare's friend and also competitor, Ben Jonson. Um, who had decided for the first time in literary history that the writings of a, even a playwright, a, you know, a form seen as kind of popular culture and you know, not uh, particularly morally savory, was important. Um, and so although at the time, the only works published in the kind of most expensive um, and durable uh, form were those by either dead authors, um, classical authors, or if alive, people like literally the King of England. Ben Jonson says, nope, it's gonna be me too. He publishes his own, what he calls not plays, but works um, in 1616 in, in a kind of finished format, not something that would change every night on the stage, but something that the author says, my version is important. And after that, all the playwrights in London kind of perk up and think, wow, this is important. And so in 1619, another pair of playwrights do their work like that, Beaumont and Fletcher. And then Shakespeare already being dead, his friends in 1623 is the third folio work of playwright. And so they put together 36 of his plays, some missing from that format actually, and, and some lost and some found later. Um, but this included the only copies we have um, of some of, of, of about 18 of his plays. Um, so they become, it, the volume becomes the only source that we have of things like Twelfth Night and, you know, Troilus and Cressida and uh, Antony and Cleopatra and Macbeth. Um, so it's a pretty important volume. Say a little bit more about the significance of the volume and also the, how many of these things are there? How many, f how many of them? There's, there's about, Ooh, I think it's about 340. They just discovered an, another one in France recently. Right, yes, we've um, that. And for a long time, you know, the significance of this book, or really any older book, you know, was, was not maybe generally appreciated. And there were always people, even from the 17th century itself, who were kind of interested in collecting um, all sorts of ephemera. Um, and then this is not really ephemera, like, like nice volumes. Um, but in the 19th century, people start getting really interested. And the Folgers, um, in particular, uh, the family that endowed the Folger Library, start collecting them very assiduously. And they collect 82. And that's the largest number in any one place. Um, so there's on, there, there are a few hundred of what you know, was a, a larger printing. Um, so it's, it's not a bad number. Maybe it may be actually lower than What was the full print run, do we know? Uh, I think it, it would have been 500. Uh -huh. And so now that I'm thinking, I may have overshot. It may be more like 240. But <laughs> it's okay, it's okay. Yeah. So how's the first folio structured? What's it like? Uh, uh, yeah, it's great. It, uh, you open it up and there's a kind of famous uh, etching of, of Shakespeare that becomes a, a kind of more dignified uh, representation of the playwright than some of the other contemporary paintings that you know, make him look more like a, a rough actor. Um, and, and then it's a very self-conscious book that tries to make claims for the importance of this person as an author. So there's poems attesting mm -hmm. to his importance, um, attesting to his personal and literary importance. Poems by other people. By other playwrights. Um, ben Jonson has a very famous tribute to Shakespeare. Later on in later print runs, later editions of the folio, second folio, third folio, other aspiring writers will want to get a poem in there to kind of make a claim for themselves. So the poet John Milton, the author of Paradise Lost, his first published work is a poem praising Shakespeare in the second folio. Um, and then there's also 
messages to different audiences, mm -hmm. royal, you know, noble audiences who might, uh, who might buy things and endow things, and then also kind of people who might buy the books. It, so different kinds of messages to different people from, the, from Hemings and Condal, his friends who put it together. And then there's a table of contents, which is kind of interesting too, because it presents in a way the most important, you know, nearly contemporary picture of how people at, in Shakespeare's day thought about the categories of his work. Mm -hmm. um, what counts as a comedy? What counts as a tragedy? And some of these have posed really interesting interpretive questions um, for hundreds of years. You know, The Tempest is the first play listed in the volume, but we don't, I mean, The Tempest is a very late work. Not mm -hmm. quite the latest work, as mm -hmm. people often think, but, um, but a very late work by Shakespeare. So why is it first? You know, is it really a comedy? Um, you know, it's the, under the category of comedy. Right, and there's only three categories in the table of contents, comedy, tragedy, and history. So hmm. they don't, the idea of romance, we now classify The Tempest and other late works as romances, was much later. Um, Fascinating, fascinating. Um, what is the, um, you, you mentioned that there's, so the, these other first folios that other people have published and his friends think that he should have one. Why, what do we know about his status uh, after his death, right after his death, that makes them think this is a guy who deserves one of these things? Is he really already turning into a, the superstar that he would become? He's not quite the superstar that he would become. I mean, and that, that starts to, that vision of Shakespeare comes much later in the you know 17th century later, but really in the 18th and 19th centuries, and reaches a kind of fever pitch in the United States actually in the 19th century when you know a third of every play produced was a Shakespeare play, and people are obsessively you know learning it and memorizing it. But you know in Shakespeare's own time, he's well known, he's prolific, uh, people like the way he writes, but he's one among many well-loved playwrights. Christopher Marlowe writes two of the sort of top five bestsellers of the period, very different style. Shakespeare's often trying to imitate it throughout his life, actually, um, you know, and there's other playwrights as well. Uh, because he, more than other playwrights, he did work with other playwrights. Many of his plays are actually collaborative. Mm -hmm. um, which we don't often think of. Um, and some of the plays that had not been considered to be by Shakespeare turned out to be the ones that he had written with other playwrights. Uh, but he's pretty quickly taken up as a, an example of a kind of writer that people get more interested in, which is someone who's respected for being a poet of nature and supposedly able to just write his ideas down without ever editing them. And this is a kind of idea about Shakespeare that gets floated very early, and indeed in the first folio where Kemmings and Condal, the producers, say, oh, he never, we received many pages from him and he never blotted line, like he had never crossed anything out, which is patently untrue. We have you know, multiple versions of his plays, which shows that like any writer and any playwright and any play producer, he was an editor, of course. Um, uh, and, and Ben Jonson famously says about this, well, would that he had blotted a thousand, you know, thinking <laughs> that there's an uneven quality even in Shakespeare. Um, so, but that, that image of him as, as the child of nature, someone who could just kind of flow verses very easily, um, was kind of taken up by that volume, and that seems to be how they're presenting him in part. Um, but also as, as someone who, whose work deserves to be memorialized. And again, seen alongside the writers who would have been at the time far more venerated, classical playwrights, classical mm -hmm. poets. Um, you know, Ben Jonson places him away from Chaucer and towards those other people, and in a, in, even in a category of his own. So he, there's some of the myths that will get taken up are, are starting to happen in, in the folio volume. Oh, yeah. fascinating. So tell us about the first folio traveling exhibition. What yeah, is this, that? This is a really exciting project um, that uh, is ultimately funded, I think, uh, mostly by the National Endowment for the Humanities um, and a little bit by Google and some other um, benefactors uh, and then administered by, as you said, the Folger Shakespeare Library, the Cincinnati Museum System, um, and the American Library Association. They, in honor of the 400th anniversary of Shakespeare's death, the folio is making available 18 of their 82 copies of the folio. Um, they're going to have them travel the country. Uh, all 50 states, the District of Columbia, Puerto Rico as well, um, and each state will have one site that hosts um, a copy of the folio, which will be open to Hamlet's uh, to be or not to be monologue, kind of the, the greatest hit, I suppose, of the folio. Um, and uh, in addition, some, some extra materials that will sort of talk about uh, the context of, of the volume um, and then some of the, the important reception history, why this has come to be so important to, to all of us. So this was a competitive selection process? Yeah, it was a, a kind of arduous application. Um, every state had competitors and um, we're really excited to be the, the Oregon site. 
why do you think the University of Oregon was chosen among the Oregon institutions that competed? Well, we're, we're really excited about the different um, parts uh, of this application, the collaboration. So uh, the, the exhibition will take place at the Jordan Schnitzer Museum on campus. Um, it will be free. Uh, and so they provided the perfect venue. Um, you know, they can take care of all the kind of security and climate requirements that are really necessary for, for exhibiting a book like this. Um, and they have an incredible education outreach um, program that, that Lisa Abia Smith runs that we're really excited to publicize um, and also to take advantage of, where they will be um, working with you know, hundreds and thousands of middle and high school and university students to talk about not only the importance of the book, but also to kind of help uh, students understand the importance of you know, creative expression, um, interpretation, analysis of literary artifacts. It's going to be a great program. They're capable of bringing in students from across the state, from, well, from, from as far north as Portland, as far south as Roseburg, um, students whose schools may have no budget mm -hmm. for school trips. They've got a bus. They will bring the students here for underserved and rural, rural uh, students. It's really exciting. So that was, I think, a really exciting piece to the, to the Folger folks. Um, and we're really pleased to be collaborating with the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. And we're working with them right now to craft an original uh, performance that will contain material that, that reflects the kind of textual significance of this volume and how it is that we get to the Shakespeare that we see in performance or that we hear circulated through the culture with sound bites like the sound and the fury or the, uh, the uh, you know, to be or not to be speech from, you know, old books that differ from each other and how we think about the differences that those, those, uh, those texts m you know, make in, in our understanding of Shakespeare. So they'll be giving a performance. Um, and we're also going to be adding to the exhibition from some uh, exciting materials uh, in our own special collections, including like literally recently discovered work. Um, my colleague Ben Saunders in English has just found out that uh, that first folio volume that I mentioned, the one that Ben Johnson put together to advertise the importance of a writer, we just realized we have a copy of it here. Um, it had not been cataloged. Um, so that also you know, was, was published in 1616, the same 400th anniversary. So we'll have it alongside the folio to be able to talk about why these kinds of books suddenly emerged and, and why they make such a difference to our, you know, all of our understandings of what it is to be an author um, and what, what the importance that we place on an individual author's work. Um, as I say, that was new. Um, and we'll have, we own copies of the second edition, the second folio and the fourth folio, so those will also be alongside. And we have a few um, kind of goodies also in special collections that we can add, you know, the, the um, minutes from the meetings of the Eugene Shakespeare Club from, you know, the early 1900s and some other stuff that, that should be really, really fun to, to, to include. So all of that, I hope, was uh, what made us a su successful bid. And we'll be working with local high school uh, teachers as well to talk about, you know, how how they teach Shakespeare, how we teach Shakespeare, how we can share the same students over time. Um, and the faculty and my colleagues in English will be giving lectures and gallery talks. So all of that, I think, was part of it. You guys will be fielding a speaker. So <laughs> We're uh, hoping to field a speaker yeah. in the Humanities Center. Uh, just on the English department, uh, tell us a little bit about the Weatherhead Lecture. Yes, we're really blessed in English to um, have a, a wonderful endowment that supports the undergraduate study of Shakespeare. Um, that's been endowed by Gloria Lee and her husband, uh, Robert Lee. And uh, we, uh, every year we have a number of activities and enrichment um, that we're able to, to use that fund to sponsor. We have sponsored um, school visits by the Oregon Shakespeare Festival every, every year for the last few years. We have an essay contest and um, one of the parts of that, uh, those activities that are really exciting to me is we, every year we invite a really dynamic and august scholar in Shakespeare studies um, to come visit and that person gives a lecture, pitch to undergraduates, visits classes, sometimes visits our local Shakespeare Breakfast Club um, and just, uh, you know, kind of shares a, a kind of national excitement about study of Shakespeare w with the whole community. And so that's been really exciting and we'll be able to draw on that to help uh, sponsor activities associated with the exhibition. So when will the first folio be here? So it starts January 5th and runs through February 7th. Yeah. So, and there's this going to be this gala opening event with the Shakespeare mm -hmm. Festival performance and that's going to happen? Uh, well, I assume it'll be the first or the second weekend. That has, we're still scheduling. <laughs> Um, how, how, how do you think the first folio will, the, its presence here will uh, serve the citizens of 
of Oregon what was. This is a good thing for the state of Oregon. Well, I think it's really exciting to be able to show uh, and, and almost you know, enable first, you know, first person contact with this artifact to see that the significance of art and theater and literature is something that people can have almost direct contact with um, and can learn about as something that takes place in history um, and has a history that it's not a matter of you know geniuses who emerge um, kind of magically from a culture, but that it takes place in the context um, of a culture in which exciting things are happening. And uh, and so they, I think it'll be a, a kind of exciting educational prospect for um, for our citizens to to kind of share that and also to in in visiting the exhibition to kind of build relationships with the university and see all the kind of riches that are happening every day um, that we see as part of our service to the state of Oregon when we're educating here. Um, and it'll be good for the students who are here now because they'll be able to do this, but it'll also be good for future students you know, whose families maybe take them to this exhibition and to start thinking a little bit about what the power of expression can be, how an individual can really shape the world um, for you know, hundreds of years um, through that kind of expressive power. You mentioned that in the 19th century, um, Shakespeare's um, sort of stature in the United States is sort of incredibly powerful, right? Yeah. So is there an explanation for that? What, what You know, you're <laughs> scholars like you, experts in the field, how do you account for that? Well, I'm fascinated by this question, to be honest, um, because we don't really have an explanation. Mm. Why is it that all of a sudden, or I mean, it's not a sudden transformation, but uh, it's a steadily changing one. Uh, someone who is seen as just a playwright, a good playwright, but a playwright among others, becomes known, and perhaps only briefly, I mean, maybe does not still have exactly this status, but as the most important writer in English. Um, and, and indeed, internationally. I mean, people learn Shakespeare globally, and Shakespeare becomes part of um, and this is part of the answer to your question, Shakespeare becomes part of the engines of colonialism. Mm -hmm. Shakespeare gets taught by in British schools all around the world as part of the empire as a way of trying to convince imperial subjects, colonial subjects, that they're benefiting from imperial rule because they have access to this as, as, as uh, Shakespeare is, is taught as now part of their culture instead of their own culture. Um, and that's actually, that influence is therefore painstakingly and carefully built by, by somewhat nefarious colonial forces. But at the same time, you have an international shift in a kind of cultural interest in the individual that starts to happen, um, in what are people's minds like? What are people's developmental stories like? And at, it's the same period that sees the growing influence importance of the novel form, and the novel that sort mm -hmm. of often focuses on psychology, on individuals' growth um, and their, their inner lives. And at that point, Shakespeare, who was always good at some things, bad at others, but really good at representing individual psychology, comes to seem like a more and more important and significant author. But it seems to me that, that those changes are hard to explain, that most of the explanations for them are circular. I mean, it, you know, that is, you can say, oh, people are more interested in the individual, but then you have to say, well, why is that? And I mean, it, all of these explanations kind of follow um, supporting each other, but there's no real ultimate explanation why in Shakespeare's own time, someone might be, in fact, the culture was more interested in the overwhelming power of the rhetoric of Christopher Marlowe, whose characterizations are quite shallow. And they mm. just found that deeply compelling. And it is beautiful, beautiful stuff. Mm -hmm. um, Johnson's poem to Shakespeare in the folio praises Shakespeare. And then he also says, and Marlowe's mighty line. I mean, he's still completely uh, starstruck by this other tradition that slowly diminishes. People don't enjoy reading Marlowe anymore, but they enjoy reading Shakespeare, but maybe not as much as they did in the 19th century. So this is a story that's still changing um, as tastes change. So you said um, he's good at some things, but he's not good at other things. So what other things isn't he good at? Well, uh, you know, Shakespeare is um, often uninterested in endings and will often mm. end abruptly or and this actually is where I start to actually like him again he's often interested in, in making endings kind of uncomfortable for the audience things don't really they're supposed to end neatly but they seem like they're not comedies end with really kind of unhappily yoked marriages or um, they just end abruptly someone is asked to marry and they never give an answer you know in measure for measure one of the plays that is only in the folio um, and uh, you know that can make 
people dislike parts of Shakespeare. Um, he's not always, I mean, he, he, in his sonnets, not something that are in the folio. He's, he's not a formal innovator. He's brilliant with language, but he's just not caring the way some of his other, um, again, uh, contemporaries really thought about interesting formal experiments. He didn't tend to do that as much. He does that in some of the later plays. Again, Antony and Cleopatra, another play that's only in the folio. There he's suddenly doing all this formal experimentation, you know, 15 scenes in an act and so forth, but he doesn't always do that. So, you know, uh, Ben Jonson, I'm talking about him a lot, but he famously criticizes uh, Shakespeare's kind of shaky sense of geography, um, continuity, is sometimes off in these plays, and that's okay because they're still dynamic on the stage, but it's just stuff that an, you know, an author isn't interested in everything. He's interested in some things and he's, he follows those, um, and he changes over time, but, you know, do you, uh, do you, people in your field, do you guys have a, an account, a sort of thumbnail account of the, what's important about Shakespeare for us? I think uh, people have many stories about what's important for Shakespeare about us, uh, for us. Um, and it ranges from, you know, the, the intricacy um, and profundity of these portraits of mind, um, but to, the, his interest in power, in social questions that are still so important to us about mm -hmm. uh, you know, the ethics of marriage, um, the nature of racial difference and tension, um, how it is that we understand the importance of commerce. I mean, the, the, you know, there's a lot of questions uh, and themes um, and also artistic uh, questions that we can take to Shakespeare and find answered in interesting ways in Shakespeare. And so, you know, one reason why there's a, a fleet of Shakespeare scholars in the world is that uh, different people's interests can be really satisfyingly investigated in Shakespeare. And so, for each of those per those folks' interests, you find a different answer to that question. So, I'm 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 now going to turn to speak to ask you some questions about one of that member of that fleet. <laughs> okay. You. So, your first book, you just mentioned one of the things that people today are interested in Shakespeare's and the questions of how he negotiates questions of race. So, your first book is about representations of race in early modern in mm -hmm. Renaissance literature. So tell us very quickly, if you can, what's the argument of that book? What's the m claim, your main claim in your first book? So I was really interested in uh, trying to answer, a, a, in a way, a very basic question. What did racial experience or racial difference look like in the 16th and 17th century, Shakespeare's day? Um, and it's hard to answer that question. With questions like race, we tend to think the answer to all such questions about what is, how does race work, uh, we tend to assume that it works the same way across time. Mm -hmm. But in fact, that's, that's not really true. It's changed quite radically, um, and so it can be hard to investigate. It, do, you know, Shakespeare will use the word black. Does he mean the same thing by it mm -hmm. that we mean? I found mm -hmm. that he did not. Um, as with others in his culture, he used the word black to, as, as we do in 21st century America, to refer to people um, who have dark skin. But he also used it to refer to people who have simply dark hair or women who are promiscuous, hmm. um, you know, a host of, of overlapping meanings. And f in my field for a long time, people had assumed that those just refer to different elements of experience. But I, in looking at a play like Othello, where both Desdemona and Othello get called black, mm -hmm. I thought, no, the answer is more complicated. And for me, it became about uh, that racial experience gets called out in this culture at moments of social tension and change. When people get married and they marry out of their ethnic group or out of their class, suddenly you get a lot of uh, racializing energies, uh, a lot of racializing language. So then the more I thought about that and investigated that, it came to seem to me that in some ways, in the end, this was actually more similar to how race works in the present day than I had at first thought. Mm. Um, that race remains fluid. If you, I mean, in sort of simple ways, you can look, if you just look at census categories over time, they just shift radically and have continued to do so even in the last 15 years. And so groups that are at one time seen as racialized, even in, you know, 100 years ago, Italian Americans or Irish Americans, and then come to seem white, um, that those stories actually relate very closely to the stories that I was seeing in Renaissance plays. Um, 
even though there are differences too. The plays that I look at were written at a time before the, ri the rise of um, racialized slavery, and that mm -hmm. makes an enormous difference to how uh, racial groups and racial individuals are imagined um, and treated. So th there, there are differences as well, but that, that's what the book kind of looks at, those different kinds of questions and answers. So that's the first book. Mm -hmm. You're at work on a second project. I am. So tell us how you got from the first one to the second one, and what, what's the second one about? Oh, well, this was one of those uh, projects that began uh, I didn't realize that I was starting a project when I began it. I just got kind of interested in depictions of speaking animals um, and gave a couple of papers on that, and that started to connect to, to and other questions. And there are questions. speaking animals in Renaissance literature. There are speaking animals, well, you know, from, from the Bible on up, right? Yeah. There are speaking animals. Um, uh, and soon I realized that the, the stakes of animal speech are, are important because for a lot of philosophers, uh, people like Aristotle, people like Descartes, language is what separates animals from people. Um, or as we might say, you know, humans from other kinds of animals. Oh, yeah. um, and it depends on how you think about it. Uh, and I soon became interested in the same way that for me, uh, questions of racial experience were illuminated when I looked at people moving over the boundary from seemingly from one racial classification to another, the same people changing. Mm -hmm. um, I, it started to seem to me the question of how people in Shakespeare's time understood human identity would similarly can be illuminated by thinking about the entities that are on the boundary. So you can look at this in a few ways as I try to do in the book. One, by finding definitions of what a human being is, such as the one, you know, human is the animal that speaks, or human is political, or human is rational, or human has ethical responsibilities because they've been created by God to have those responsibilities. And then I would find examples from this period of creatures that met those definitions but are sort of obviously not human. So animals that speak, robots that feel and think and talk. Um, and then I was also interested in depictions of uh, beings that are obviously human and treated as such, but in some ways are, are represented as resembling non, like again, obviously non-human entities. So people who have, uh, are described as functionally flinty in heart, like having a special kind of heart that, uh, that sparks only when, when frictively assaulted, like actually uh, uh, characters in, in Julius Caesar, actually, um, and uh, like numerous characters in Julius Caesar, um, or people who are described as sort of almost allegorically abstract. So I'm just kind of looking at these entities to try and think about the lessons that we can learn about this definition, uh, what separates the human from the inhuman. And the stakes of this are also related to the first project because it has also always been the case that when you define the human, uh, those excluded from that definition are often treated badly. Animals are the things that we're allowed to vivisect or to eat, um, or uh, people who are considered not to have souls are those we can enslave. So the stakes for this kind of treatment uh, have to do with ethical stakes, and I'm particularly interested in a really tolerant tradition that I'm finding alongside a more exclusive one that kind of I think has valuable lessons for us about uh, inclusiveness. Well, thank you for sharing everything you've shared with us today about the First Folio Traveling Exhibit that's coming here in January of 2016. Thank you for talking about your work, and uh, thank you for taking the time. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. I've been speaking with Laura Bavilsky, Professor of English, Associate Professor of English at the University of Oregon. She's been instrumental in organizing the Shakespeare First Folio Exhibit, which will travel to the University of Oregon in January 2016. Thanks very much for watching.